<clears throat> okay, so, uh, quick review of lecture one. <clears throat> lecture one, we talked about use cases of linear algebra. The most important thing to remember from the big list of use cases of linear algebra is that most of them involve taking a derivative of something and uh, using that as your matrix. And then we do stuff with that matrix of derivatives. Uh, typical examples are we've got a bunch of equations, so like a vector valued function f of a bunch of variables x, and then we take a big matrix that's partial of each, uh, each equation with respect to each variable x, or sorry, partial of each value of the function, or if it's a set of equations, then each equation, uh, partial fi, partial xj, and a big old matrix. And then you'd talk about things like, well, we're gonna dot that with some vector dx to approximate changes in these guys. And we could talk about things like, how sensitive are these guys to changes in different directions? Or you could talk about uh, finding dx's to try to like find where the functions will take on a particular value, that sort of thing. Or if these are a, if these are specifying a set of differential equations, like this is dx dt, then you would look at maybe the eigenvalues of this matrix to, to like solve the, those equations, right? <clears throat> or locally solve the equations. Uh, so that's like a whole class of things we're interested in. Another class of things we're, we're interested in is we have a function which is just a scalar function, 1D output of a bunch of variables, and we want to look at a second derivative matrix. So d squared g dxi dxj for each pair of variables xi and xj. And then similarly, there's a bunch of questions we can ask there. For instance, we might want to invert that matrix when we're doing an optimization problem, or we might want to uh, look at the eigenvalues of that matrix to figure out the, uh, the shape or the curvature of this function near a maximum or minimum. So those were like sort of general prototypical use cases of, of linear algebra. The first thing we're going to talk about today is like how to work with these sorts of matrices efficiently. Okay? So first of all, presumably you guys have heard of backpropagation. Does anyone want to derive it? Nobody. All right, we're gonna derive it. Let's do it. <laughs> so, basic idea of backpropagation. We've got some function defined by a big old circuit. So, Circuit here is a technical term. Basically means you've got a uh, bunch of little arrows. You got, uh, so we've got like this graph with a bunch of arrows in it. We have our inputs here. These are x's like x1, x2, x3. And then our circuit says, all right, in order to compute f, the output of our circuit, we're going to first compute this thing and this thing, and then we're going to compute that next thing. And at each of these nodes, there's a little formula that says how to compute that thing in terms of its parents. So for instance, I could make up a function that would match this graph. Here's, here's a function that would match this graph. In Python, I would say f of x1, x2, x3. And let's say here, we're going to have to give these guys some names. I'm not going to be very creative about the names. Uh, let's say y1 equals x1 plus x2, uh, y2 equals x2 squared, uh, y3, don't push more of these, y3, y4, y3 equals uh, y1 plus y2 times x3. Uh, y4 equals, uh, let's say, y1 plus y, so 3, yeah, 3, and then I'm getting tired of this, so we're going to say this is f of x. <laughs> uh, so then return takes in y, y4 and y3, so this will be a return, let's say, 
now we've got this nice simple, uh, this nice simple circuit here. <coughs> now the question is, we want to like efficiently compute a derivative of this function with respect to those variables, right? This is your standard backpropagation setup. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat these as a set of equations and just do like our, our prototypical thing that we do with a bunch of equations. Uh, we, we write them all out. We've got y1 equals x1 plus x2, for instance. But I'm going to differentiate both sides of this with respect to a, a little element d, dy, and dx. So I get uh, dy1. I'm going to explicitly write 1 times d dot dy1 equals 1 times dx1 plus 1 times dx2. I'm going to do that for every single line of this equation of, of this system, right? So when I have a line that says, uh, so every line is going to be of the form yi equals fi of y, y sub parents of i. Uh, so this notation just means uh, you're taking whatever indices of y are its parents, so like for y2. For y3, I'd be looking at y1 and y2 here, and then also x parents of i. Okay. <clears throat> and then when I do this differential thing, I'm going to get dyi equals partial fi partial y parents of i times d, d uh, y parents of i plus partial fi, partial x parents of i, dx parents of i. All right, so I'm going to get a whole set of equations like this. Right? Now I'm going to write these equations in a vector form. So I'll have, pile all these dy's up into a big old vector dy. That's going to be equal to partial f, partial y divided with dy. So now I'm unpacking all these little parents of i's into one big vector. And this guy right here, this partial f partial y, is going to be a sparse matrix. Uh, so for instance, if I look at uh, the, which row of the matrix do I want? To Let's look at this row of the matrix. <clears throat> in this case, something in row one, something in row two, Row three, I'm going to have a derivative of x3 with respect to y1 and a derivative of x3 with respect to y2. And then everything else is going to be zero because there aren't any more y's in here. Right? And similarly with all the other rows, they're each going to have like, say, uh, at most two non-zero entries in there. So this matrix is going to be very sparse. This matrix is also going to be lower diagonal. Anybody want to tell me why it's lower diagonal? Sorry, lower triangular, not lower diagonal. Terminology. Yes? The, the, it's a stack. They can't depend on the related one. Bingo. Each, each of these guys can only depend on the things that came earlier. So we're only going to see non zero elements below the diagonal here. In fact, it's strictly lower diagonal because these things don't depend on themselves either. So we'll only see non-zero elements strictly below that diagonal. Uh, then we'll have a second term here for the x part. The partial f, partial x, divided with dx. <clears throat> and similarly, that one will also be sparse. You'll only have non-zero entries where this y index depends on some of the x's. All right, so now I've got this nice vector equation. Let's, let's go ahead and solve this bad boy. We've got a, a dy on both sides, so we're going to gather those together. We'll get, uh, kind of explicitly write an identity here. Do that for three. Get identity minus partial f partial y divided with dy is equal to partial f, partial x, divided with dx. Good so far? And now the question is, how can I 
uh, cheaply solve this set of linear equations to get the thing I want, which is the uh, derivative of the last y value with respect to x. So in particular, I'm going to need to somehow do a, a matrix inverse here. Well, this matrix, what does it look like in terms of sparsity pattern? <clears throat> On the diagonal, it's all ones. That is the, this identity here. Above the diagonal, it's zero. And then this part in here is sparse. The numbers will, will like depend on stuff, but it's all sparse in there. So we know any efficient ways to solve equations involving lots of sparsity and a triangular matrix. Like some Gaussian elimination thing? Exactly! You run Gaussian elimination on this thing, it's going to be real fast and easy. Crazy. <laughs> and it turns out that if you run Gaussian elimination on this thing, it ends up being back wrong. Uh, there, there's actually one more trick that we need here uh, where you, we don't actually need the entire inverse matrix because we're only looking at the derivative of like f of x itself with respect to the x's. Uh -huh. uh, so we just need, uh, I think it's one row of the inverse matrix. And to get like one row of this matrix, it's just like shoop, 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 shoop the end of the final row. So if this, if this computation has like m arrows in it, then you only need about m operations to uh, solve out that matrix. You get Make sense? That's the magic of backprop. <clears throat> so, most important takeaway here is uh, you've got some function, multivariate function, and in if it takes m steps to compute it, then we can get the gradient in O of m. Okay? Uh, so, uh, m steps. We'll also say that inputs are nvars. We'll make that later. And we want to call the variable for outputs. I've used n and m now. We need a different variable for the number of outputs. So far, we just have one. K. All right, k outputs. Great. So back prop, we can do O of M to get a derivative of one output. One output with respect to N inputs. Okay, that's a good start. And of course, you, you probably, I assume you've all used this before. You've all used this before, right? Yeah. Mostly. Okay. <clears throat> but in practice, we often want to do more interesting things. So let's talk about more complicated matrices. Uh, we said earlier two kinds of things we want. One of them, we have a bunch of outputs with respect to a bunch of inputs, and we want to talk about that matrix. The other one, we have a Hessian matrix, so second derivative of some scalar function with respect to uh, pairs of inputs. How many, if we just like directly apply the backprop algorithm to compute these matrices, how many steps will it take? There you go. I would think M, K. Right here, you've got K outputs. So okay. you need to run the backprop algorithm once for each of them. So that's O of M, K. All right, how about the other one? M squared. Uh, hang on a minute. I think the O of, well, okay. Should be I think O of n plus m times m something like that. It's it's fuzzy because like it depends on how big n is compared to m. But sure, let's call it m squared for now. Mm -hmm. 
point, point is uh, m is going to be at least linear in n, so this is going to be at least quadratic in n, which makes sense because like it's an n by n matrix. You're not going to get any faster than that. <clears throat> but this is slow. Uh, in particular, this guy is obviously more than linear, uh, and this guy unless you have a very small number of functions that you're, that you're differentiating, this guy is also going to be more than linear. Why is more than linear runtime a problem? Well, in practice, we get a whole bunch of data, right? The cost of collecting that data, the cost of storing that data, the cost of loading that data, and the cost of pre-processing that data usually scales linearly. So if you are ever doing anything that scales more than linearly, or linear-ish, you know, we're kind of okay with n log n, but if you're doing something that scales substantially more than linearly, you're not going to be able to do that on whatever your biggest data set is, because your biggest data set is always going to be something where, like, all you can afford is linear. So that's, like, you know, the bare minimum that you can do on data. So, in particular, for neural networks, if you're doing anything more than linear-ish, you're just like, nope, not going to happen. Forget about it. <clears throat> that's why nobody uses transformers. What was that? That's why nobody uses transformers. Transformers are linear enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we don't use big transformers. Yeah. We keep them small. Yeah. It's yeah. a problem. They're kind of tiny, no, frankly. <laughs> uh, right. So, point is, we'd, we'd like to be able to work with these in linear time. So, how do we do that? Step one is do not actually compute the whole matrix. That is the first and most important thing, is if you're working with a Hessian or you're working with a Jacobian that's big, you do not want to compute that whole matrix. So what can you do to avoid computing the whole matrix? Uh, scientific, scientific computing libraries have some, some nice tools for this. Uh, we're not going to talk just yet about how they work, the algorithms behind them, but we are going to talk about how to use them. Uh, so, for instance, I'll talk about sci-fis because they're the ones I know best. Uh, SciPy has the sparse library, specifically sparse linear algebra. Sparse.linalg. And in this library are a few important things. First, there's something called the linear operator class. And second, there's a bunch of methods that can take in linear operators, whatever those magical things are. Uh, for instance, you can compute eigenvalues of linear operators, or you can uh, do solve linear equations involving linear operators. I think it's called linsolve. It's either solve or linsolve. I don't remember. Or you can get uh, there's eigenvalues. Of course, you can do a singular vector decomposition of a linear operator. All those nice things. And the important thing is that all of these methods can run on a linear operator which never actually explicitly represents the matrix. So how, how do you do that? How does it work? The idea is, a, for, to define a linear operator, you don't have to tell me the whole matrix, but you do have to be able to take in a vector and tell me what, have, what I get if I multiply that vector by a matrix. So linear operator, you define a method called matvec. Sometimes it's specific. It's called uh, L matvec or R matvec if you're specifically multiplying on the left or on the right. Uh, but like the general form is matvec. It's going to take in some vector v, uh, and this vector v, you don't get to choose what v is. Like these methods, when they're using your linear operator, they're going to pass you a whole bunch of different v's. And every time one of these methods passes you a v, you have to say, okay, here's the value of my matrix multiplied by v. And we can do that quite efficiently for these because, for instance, for the Jacobian here, what I can do is I can take uh, f of x dot with v, so far so good, still linear time, right? And then I differentiate that with respect to x. v is constant with respect to x. So if I'm differentiating this thing with respect to x, well, that's just the same as this matrix dotted with v. Hey, that's nice. That means even though we can't compute this whole matrix in linear time, we can dot this matrix with any particular vector in linear time. And that's the magical thing we want here. That, that's why we use this linear operator thing, is because now these methods can go 
uh, do linear time queries on our, on our linear operator representing this matrix and spit out eigenvalues and solve equations and all that nice stuff. Make sense? All right. How would you do something like this for a Hessian? Guesses? All right, uh, here's step one. It's actually almost the same as this. Step one, we're going to take a gradient of g with respect to x, just using plain old backprop. So far so good, still linear. Now we're gonna dot that with b. Okay, and then what? Now take the gradient. Now take a gradient, yeah. This guy's a scalar, so we can take a gradient of this guy in linear time, and boom, this thing is equal to the Hessian dotted with V. Well, why are we confident we can take these like outside derivatives in linear time? Uh, so taking another derivative here, good question. So if you, if you look at how the backprop algorithm works, you've got like your original circuit, and your original circuit is roughly size M, now you come through and do backprop on it, and backprop is itself a big circuit, right? It's just doing a bunch of arithmetic. So like you can represent uh, the, the forward pass plus the backprop as another big circuit. And I'm not going to be able to draw a realistic one off the top of my head, but let's pretend that's what it would look like. And the important thing is uh, that new circuit is going to be roughly size 2M. It'll, it'll take, it'll about double the time. Uh, <clears throat> then when we go to the second derivative, it's going to take about 4m. Uh, and this, this is also the reason why you don't want to take too many derivatives. It, it does <laughs> blow up exponentially. <clears throat> you definitely don't want to do like 10 derivatives. Okay. So far so good? Making sense? Like a backprop with respect to one output is like O of M. For the like Jacobian, mm -hmm. we are getting like multiple outputs. Uh, yeah, let's let's. So the shape here, f of x itself is uh, n dimensional. Uh, f dot v is going to be one dimensional. Then. <laughs> Partial x, partial that is once again going to be, sorry, that, not n dimensional, k dimensional. There, that guy was k dimensional. And then the final output is going to be n dimensional. Those are the shapes we're dealing with here. Does that answer your question? Is it linear though? Is what linear? The Jaco when we do this like Matt Beck Jacobian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this calculation here will be linear because it just needs uh, linear time, m time to compute f. Uh, dotting with b is, you know, it's, a, it's a dot product on k things, that takes k time. Uh, and then differentiating all that, well, you've got computation of size m plus k, so this will be just m plus k. All right, cool. All linear. And then similarly down here. All right, other questions? How are we doing on time? 27 minute five. 27, all right. So I guess that puts us a little less than halfway through. Uh, let's briefly talk about what it looks to actually call these things, because the type signatures can be a little confusing if you haven't dealt with higher order functions a lot before. Have you guys dealt with higher order functions a lot before? Not a ton, but I get the concept. All right, cool. So, when I go to, let, let's say, for concreteness, I want to find the eigenvalues of a Hessian matrix of something, okay? <clears throat> so I've got my function g that I want to g 
that I want to compute my uh, my Hessian oath. I have I have been there. <laughs> yeah. Right there yeah. we go. You know this... when you want to find the eigenvalues of the Hessian. Yeah, exactly. It's been so long <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this should be this should be familiar. For you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm looking for eigenvalues of a Hessian. Uh, I've got my function g, which is definitely a good letter to represent a loss function. Not that this is a loss function or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to need a point at which to evaluate it. So, like, I, like I'm taking Hessians are always taken at a point, right? So okay. these might, for instance, be the point that your training process <laughs> converges to. <laughs> like, maybe I don't know. That's a great example. I've actually misled you slightly by putting an X here. Maybe it'd be less confusing if it were theta. Yeah. <laughs> Ignore that for now. <clears throat> uh, so we'll call that point X naught. Uh, now I'm going to need to call something to actually like do this calculation. Uh, it turns out most that most uh, automatic differentiation libraries have a magic function which does this. Uh, it's called either Hessian vector product, Hessian vector product, or HPP. <laughs> Uh, and what you're going to pass in here is g and x naught. Oh, sorry, and also the vector that you're taking a product with. g x naught b. Uh, and like there, there may be some variation on this type signature. Uh, some libraries will curry some of the arguments. So then, for instance, you might call it like this. Thing, something else, but roughly speaking, these are these are the three arguments that you'll have to pass into HVP, and then it'll pass out your Hessian dotted with B. <clears throat> All right. Uh, then to call, for instance, eigs. Eigs will take in a linear operator. So my linear operator will be a function. Are you guys comfortable with lambda function notation? Function. In the Python way, yes, not in like the Haskell way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you, you can draw. I was about like, to mix I, them. Sorry, I actually meant like not in, like the lambda calculus way. Yeah, okay. I don't know what, what Haskell way is. I mean, the, exact same thing. the Python way is kind of supposed to mimic the lambda calculus way. But yeah. It's not a perfect mimic. Anyway, so <laughs> we have a function, or sorry, let's back up here. We're going to have to pass in some sort of linop. Gogs. And the way we're going to set up our linop is it'll be a subclassing linear operator. So we've got our linop subclassing linear operator. And we'll define the mathback function. Mathback of B. And what that mathback function will do is call this guy. So HBP of G X naught B. And that's what it'll return. And then we take linop, we pass it to eigs, and that'll calculate the, the eigenvalues. Make sense? And uh, similarly for other use cases, like if you were doing some sort of SVD on a Jacobian or a linsolve on a Jacobian or whatever, same sort of pattern. You're going to set up, you're going to define a linear operator. So you'll subclass the linear operator class, define a mathback function, and then call whatever function you need to from the library. Uh, the other one, main one that you might need to use is the Jacobian vector product. Which does what it sounds like and has a similar type signature. Uh, you'll call that in your mathback function and then you're good to go. Make sense? All right, so hopefully we have now entirely demystified the linear operator magic. We now know how to do linear time operations. There's no further confusion, right? <clears throat> Great. <laughs> uh, any other questions before I move on to another thing? Yeah. Oh, I should mention uh, the, the places you would find these methods in Torch, I think they're in autograd.functional. 
uh, in jacks, I think they're just top level. In TensorFlow, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, and that completes the list. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll just leave the question of how you calculate eigenvalues using only this. Yes, that a is a fun topic, <laughs> yeah. which we'll probably get into next lecture, I think. Yeah. If you want to, so I can give I can give a very brief example of an algorithm that you shouldn't actually use, but it will give you like an idea of why it's even possible to calculate eigenvalues this I, way. I vaguely have read things like this before, if people aren't interested. <laughs> I understand. To me, ca calculating eigenvalues is always absolute magic. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> here, here's like some intuition for why it's even possible to calculate eigenvalues by just dotting a matrix with vector over and over again. Uh, so if we have, <laughs> if we have our matrix M, then the eigenvalue... Yeah, just like, it'll just take the, the vector and it'll just push it closer <laughs> to the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue decomposition, yeah. we've got u lambda u transpose, where lambda is diagonal. So if we raise m to the nth power, then we've got u lambda to the n u transpose. And if we dot that with a vector, which we can do by just repeatedly hitting that vector with n, n times in a row, then we've got u lambda to the n u transpose b. Now, the nice thing about raising a bunch of eigenvalues to the n is if one of them is a little bit bigger than any of the others, after you raise them all to the n, that one's going to be a lot bigger than all the others. Right? It's going to be getting bigger exponentially quickly. Which means that after n steps, you can sort of approximate this as u times the maximum eigenvalue to the n, and then a bunch of zeros. You know? So it's a reasonable approximation. <laughs> <laughs> roughly speaking, u transpose b, uh, which means you're really just, this, this matrix is just like picking out the first column of u and the first row of u transpose. So this is going to be approximately the first eigenvector, u1, times lambda1 to the n, times uh, u1 transpose b. So roughly speaking, if you just do this, you're going, what you're going to get out is something that's basically proportional to the first eigenvector. Assuming that you know, your, your eigenvalue is reasonably well separated, there's not another one that's too close to it. And that's like, that's like a sort of starting point for why it would even be possible to use something like a linear operator to figure out eigenvalues. Make sense? Anyway. More on that at a later date. Uh, check my notes. Okay. So the next thing I want to cover today is get a little bit fancier with our like nice representations of uh, of these derivative matrices. So we can do the linear operator thing, which is basically treating our matrix as a magic black box, right? All it can do is dot with vectors. And that's nice. We have some algorithms that can use matrices as magic black boxes and give us stuff we want out of it, but it's sort of limited. Like, without having any access to the sort of internal structure of these matrices, we can't really do anything clever with it turns out that our magic black box algorithm isn't working very well, we're just sort of stuck. So, can we get an efficient representation, or an efficient algorithm for working with these matrices? That's not a magic black box. It's the next piece. <clears throat> Here, here's the core idea. Um, so when we talked about the backprop algorithm, One way to think about what we are doing here is we had a set of equations y equals f of x. Leave off the vector for now. We differentiated. I've got m to dy equals partial f partial y dy plus partial x. What 
what we did then was we basically eliminated all of the dy's except for the last one conceptually so what we said what we had this like identity minus partial f partial y dy equals partial f partial x dx and we basically used these equations to eliminate all but one of our dy's we said all but all but one of our dy's to zero and then the last dy was the output one, the one that we cared about. So by like solving this system, we solved for the last dy in terms of dx, and all the rest of the dy's were eliminated. Okay. And this is the part where nobody was here for the last lecture. Okay. <laughs> so last lecture, we uh, talked about eliminating equations. So in general, if you have a, I'm going to write this as a block matrix. So I have like each of these is a submatrix, A, B, C, D. If I have a, a set of equations here, so I've got uh, x1, x2, and then I'm solving for y1, y2. A common thing that I want to do is use these equations to eliminate these variables. So here's some equations, here's some variables. I want to eliminate those variables using those equations. Make sense? So let's let's go ahead and do that. Now I didn't actually work through it last time. Let's actually do it this time. Uh, so I'll take. I'm trying to eliminate x2. So this equation says cx1 plus dx2 equals y2. So if I eliminate x2 from that, I'm going to get uh, x2 equals d inverse times y2 minus cx1. Okay. Then I'm going to plug this back in as a value for x2 and look at these equations. So I'll get ax1 plus d times this value for x2, d inverse times y2 minus cx1. That's going to be equal to y1. <clears throat> uh, and we can move the y back over to there. And the important thing we get out of this is a minus, minus signs coming around here, a minus b, d inverse c times x1 equals something that we don't actually care about that much. <clears throat> and this, this matrix is the magical thing. This is called a sure complement. Uh, and if you do certain kinds of numerical work, this comes up all over the place. Uh, for instance, if you've ever looked at making low rank updates to matrices, you can do like low rank updates to the inverse of a matrix in linear time by using basically this idea, an algorithm that uses this. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, it's just a thing that comes up a lot. And the reason it comes up a lot is because very often we want to eliminate some variables using some of the equations. So like that's the thing that pops out when you eliminate some of the variables using some of the equations. Make sense? Now, in the case of our uh, backprop algorithm, or in the case of derivatives more generally, our system of equations is very nice and sparse, right? Like we, we went through that earlier. If we tried to invert this thing explicitly, it would not be nice and sparse. But one thing we can do is say, look, the, the, the thing that I'm interested in, these derivatives, they're a sure complement within a sparse matrix. So instead of thinking of it as like just a dense matrix, I'm going to think of it as I have this big sparse matrix and I'm taking a sure complement in it. And then if I ever need to go actually compute the thing, then I can go like actually compute the sure complement and like we know how to do that efficiently. But the more important thing is like when I'm thinking of, uh, when I'm looking at properties of this matrix, for instance, if I'm trying to get a rough estimate of its eigenvalues, 
in order to uh, precondition a numerical solver. I can look at that sure complement and think like, hmm, what is the structure of that sure complement, or sorry, look at the big matrix and be like, hmm, what does the structure of that big matrix look like? What sorts of eigenvalues do I expect that big matrix to have? And then I can use those to uh, narrow in on my estimate of the sure complement, because like there's standard methods for bounding the eigenvalues of the sure complement using the eigenvalues of the big matrix, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to go like super into depth on that right now. The main point of this is for you to have like seen it once. So if at some point in your life you're like, man, I have this big goddamn matrix and I really need to work with it efficiently, these black box methods just aren't good enough, then you can go look up, you can go look up how to represent the thing as a sure complement and look up sort of things you can bound on the, using a sure complement, how to like get estimates of an inverse or how to get estimates of eigenvalues or what have you. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 